Uh, we have two polls uh, presenters, uh, Eric Parsley uh, and Brian DeHarnas. Uh, Eric Parsley is a licensed professional engineer with experience in a variety of different environmental engineering disciplines, including stormwater, water, wastewater, solid waste, and air pollution projects. His duties involve planning, design, project management, as well as assistance with regulatory compliance, permitting, and enforcement proceedings. He has also prepared a variety of water resources type master plans and worked with industrial and municipal clients to implement best management practices. Eric's a project manager with Commonwealth. He's been with us for 14 years, and he has a BS in civil engineering from Purdue University. Uh, the other presenter, Brian DeHarnas, is a uh, project manager. He's been with the company for approximately eight years. He has a PhD in civil engineering from Northwestern University, an MS from environmental engineering from Rose Holman, and a BS from civil Engin engineering from Merrimack College. Uh, both Brian and Eric are going to uh, be presenting on super sewer modeling and portfolio of success. Okay, uh, yeah, super sewer modeling, uh, portfolio of success. So what we're going to go through today is basically how we apply scientific and engineering principles to create a model. So it reminded me of a movie from the 80s. I don't know if you guys remember it. Uh, <laughs> Brian brought it up to me that uh, as we age, our audience may not understand this or get this reference very well, but basically we're going to take data, we're going to take calculations, we've got equations, uh, we're going to do field work, we're going to stuff all this stuff into a computer, and we're going to generate a model. And I guarantee it's not going to look anything like her. So <laughs> I don't know if you guys remember who that was, but uh, this may be a quiz question later, but it's Kelly LeBrock. We're going to talk a little bit about calibrating and verifying models. And then if you've got one, I don't know how many of you guys have a, have a, a hydraulic model or sewer model, but you'll recalibrate a model. Well, she was recently on Celebrity Fit Club, so I think she just had a recalibration. <laughs> what, what we're going to go through today, um, just our agenda. I, I get the first half. Brian gets the second half. Uh, why do I need a model? Uh, that what it takes to actually build a model, uh, water and sewer system models, just a brief comparison of the two. I told Rick from Monroe City that I'd say something about water so he'd feel a little bit more comfortable, so we'll hit it then. Um, and then Brian's going to go through some software examples. But really the story I'm wanting to get across today, um, you know, not to go into too much detail about the models, but just so that uh, you guys have a basic understanding of what it takes to, to build the model, and an appreciation for that so that you can understand how this tool is something that may benefit you or whenever your system gets to the point that you need it, uh, what the capabilities are and what some of the drawbacks are. So jumping into that, first of all, why do I need a model? Okay, the first thing that's going to really pop up is why do you need to do anything? You may have a regulatory requirement that requires you to have this as a tool in your toolbox, um, especially as it relates to sewers. If you're a combined sewer uh, facility, or you have a combined sewers in your, uh, in your system, uh, you've had to generate a combined sewer overflow and operational plan. Vince mentioned that earlier in one of the presentations. Uh, you've also had to prepare a long-term control plan. Uh, both of those plans really are keyed in on optimizing your facilities, maximizing those facilities, how much can you store in the system before you have an overflow, and what capital improvements projects do you need to do in order to minimize overflows to those systems. Uh, modeling is an excellent tool to be able to identify what those, what those are. Without it, a lot of times you're kind of guessing in the dark. The first few years, you may know of some low-hanging fruit, uh, some obvious problems in the system. Once you get those knocked out out of the way, uh, then you run into the problem of, okay, now what do I do? Where do I spend my money? Um, modeling can also show you where you may have pipe restrictions. Going back to the separate sanitary sewer guys, those guys that don't have combined sewers per se, we've all got wet weather problems. Uh, everybody's got aging facilities. Even some of the newer facilities are having wet weather problems. Um, if you're so fortunate to have SSOs along with that, um, you know that you've got issues that need to be addressed. Oftentimes, we can't just find those with traditional means of smoke testing, um, TVing, or flow modeling, or flow monitoring. Uh, 
we may need to go to another step, which is where we actually model the system to try to figure out where some of our bottlenecks are. Um, another place that it's, that it's very useful for is predictive analysis. Um, and what I mean by that is, uh, you know, where do we make improvements in the system? As your systems get bigger, get more complicated, again, you knock out your low-hanging fruit, you've still got issues, maybe it's not so easy to see where that is. Uh, th this can allow you to identify some problems in the system. And what happens when your systems grow? Uh, Newburgh has had a substantial amount of growth. Everybody's, we've talked about it numerous times. Uh, they've, had, they've modeled a number of years ago. They're considering actually updating that model now, considering some changes that they've made. Uh, because as the systems grow and, and flow enters into the old parts of the system, uh, you know, your SSO issues and your overflow issues just get worse and worse. Um, and also, there again, we're just kind of talking about an impact on development. So what's a hydraulic model look like? Um, you know, everybody's kind of got a different vision of what it is. Uh, but is it a physical thing? A lot of people, you know, I know we had one client one time that we were doing a model for, and they got a new council person come in, and they said, we want to come in and we want to see the model. We want to see where it's set up at. Well, they had in their mind something three-dimensional and physical. Uh, that's really not what it is. Uh, the sample that I've got up here, though, is uh, San Francisco Bay Area. Um, the Corps of Engineers did build a physical model of the San Francisco Bay Area. They've got a whole visitor center uh, around this thing that's been in place for years. Now, that model is an acre and a half. It's huge. And you can get an idea when you see the people standing next to it right there, and that's just a portion of the model. Um, so. Uh, obviously, their, uh, uh, their resources are quite a, get, quite a bit more than what most of, uh, most of us have at our disposal to be able to model. Uh, but they use this for scientific experiments to verify some of the computer things that they've had. And again, they've showcased it and turned it into kind of a, uh, an attraction, I guess, for people like us that would go out there. But um, more realistically, what we're looking at uh, is actually a, a, a collection of equations and uh, uh, hydraulic tools that we have available to us. Uh, the first, uh, first thing there, some of you guys may have seen this, the ISCO Open Channel Flow Measurement Handbook. It's just got a bunch of charts and tables in it that can help us predict what's going on in an open channel flow situation. There's flow charts, circular graphs that you can do to predict flow. Um, you know, other, uh, here's, some, here's some weirs. Uh, that show, you know, if you know the level of the flow going over the, or the level of the water going over the weir, you can predict what the flow rate is. Um, you know, there have been equations derived for years for the purpose of describing what's going to happen with the flow and predicting what's going to happen with your flow. Now, more commonly in our industry, what we're doing is we're designing new facilities. We're looking for uh, uh, you know, what size do we meet, need to make those facilities? Uh, we may have the flow, and we're trying to determine uh, what size to make facilities. When we're modeling sewer systems and water systems, it's kind of a reverse of that. We've got an existing situation. We're trying to make our calculations fit, if you will. Um, we can do pretty simple stuff on paper. Uh, we can do Excel spreadsheets and do those things uh, pretty simply with these equations. But when we get into larger systems, when we get into things like this, and all these lines represent sewers, uh, when you're talking thousands of feet of line, hundreds of manholes, um, it's just too much. It's just too big of a volume of information to have to deal with and have to, uh, and have to reiterate. The other thing we have to worry about is it's dynamic. Uh, this is the Bellagio Fountains in Vegas. And uh, what we have is, you know, we could set up a huge spreadsheet and, and, uh, and do all these calculations, but as soon as you change some of those variables, you're going to do that again. So you've got hours and hours of time that you're going to have consumed into, uh, into those calculations. So really what the models do um, is what computers are for. It's to do repetitious things faster than we can humanly possible, but we have to build it. Uh, we have to build that model in order to allow it to do that job for us. So um, the, the, the point is, let's get it built right in the first place so that, uh, uh, you know, it does it effectively. So what's involved with building the model? Pretty basic stuff. Uh, we need the information. Uh, we're going to start with the maps of your system. Uh, hopefully you've got a 
better mapping system than that was actually a picture taken in my office. But, uh, you know, hopefully you maybe got some GIS at this point, at least a system map that we're going to start with. Um, and we're going to start, uh, start laying out the system in a 3D, uh, in a 3D system in, within the computer program. There's various types of software that you can use to do this. Um, but some of the variables we're going to need, we're going to need manhole information. Uh, that's actually a card from Newberg where they uh, document all their manholes. We're going to need the depth of the manhole. We're going to need elevations of the rim, pipes going in and out, and the configuration of those pipes. Uh, we're going to need to know if there's a drop, if there's some kind of a, a diversion structure in there. Um, all of these are things that are going to affect the hydraulics. If you've got a weir, it's going to affect the hydraulics. Depending on how it turns, it's going to affect uh, how fast water moves through there. Um, pumps. If you've got pump curves, that's great. We're going to put that in, in the model as well. Uh, because that's going to be another, uh, another critical element in the model as you have, uh, as you have your, your systems discharging into those pumps, and then what that in turn does to the downstream systems. And finally, some topographic information. I mentioned uh, the elevations for the manholes, but also that's important, obviously, for water systems as well, because that's going to affect the flow. Um, so how do we build it? Well, it's all about... Um, really kind of nodes and links, links and nodes. Um, it's not very pretty to look at, but uh, the nodes are going to be your junction points in a water system. They're going to be mainly like your manholes in uh, a, a collection system. And the links are going to be, uh, are going to be your conduits and your piping. Um, these are just a couple of capture screens that we did, of some input screens that show what those look like. There's various different things in the software uh, to select different types of structures at those nodes. Um, and then as far as the conduits or the pipe, uh, you can see we've got the circular option, square option, a user-defined option. We've got some open channel flow options here for different, uh, different shapes of those conduits, because all that, again, affects how water flows through there. Now, just to, just to keep in mind, uh, you know, we've got continuity of flow. All the flow that's going in is coming out somewhere. But what makes a difference is the time, how it gets there, and where it comes out. Uh, so that really kind of walks us into uh, looking at some examples of water and sewer models and what the differences are uh, between those. A water system is, you know, generally more of a closed loop type situation. Uh, what we're going to want to look at there, we're going to be under pressure. Uh, so we're dealing with equations to deal with pipe that's under pressure, not the open channel situation, such as a gravity sewer. Uh, so we've got our input, which is going to be our source of water, which may be going through a water plant. It may be your connection to whoever you buy water from. Uh, but we've got a, basically a source of water and a, usually a pressure point at, at that location. We've got our network of pipes that's serving your homes. Um, you got your mains, main lines through there. And you may have a storage tank or two that's going to be another pressure point. And also, what's not really depicted here is depending on if you've got different zones in your system, you'll have uh, booster pumps and things throughout, throughout the system as well. So all that will be input into the model. And I told you it doesn't look as good as Kelly LeBrock did. This is really what it looks like. Um, it's just a system of lines and nodes with some numbers around it and, uh, and data associated with that. I kind of use the analogy, it's similar to GIS, if you will. Um, it's not a very, but it's not a very great graphical representation, but there's a lot of calculations that are going on uh, simultaneously as we try to uh, determine what, what's going on in that system with the computer model. This is a simple model system, uh, system that we modeled uh, for the town of Campbellsburg, which is over near uh, Salem. And uh, you may look at this and say, gosh, you know, the lines that are on there, the colored lines represent different pipe sizes. And um, you think, man, doing a model for that system is a lot of overkill. Uh, you know, there's just not a lot there. Uh, but what we found with them, was there's, not a lot of, there's not a lot to do with Campbellsburg itself, but they wholesale to a much larger customer. They wholesale to what was uh, the North Brown Water Company at the time. Uh, this was Campbellsburg in this little gray box here. This was the service area for who they sold to. It's very rural, still not a lot of customers, but a lot of topography difference. And another thing that made this a little bit difficult is that Campbellsburg operated two water plants. They operated a water plant 
on the river up here at a very low elevation. And then they operate, also operate a water plant on the south end of town um, uh, with just some wells that are into, into a rock formation there, an aquifer and rock formation there. Um, in between there, we had booster pump. We had some pressure relief valves that had to be installed uh, and, and just really added to the complication of the system. Uh, there was two storage tanks. There was one elevated tank in town, one ground tank. Um, and uh, I, think, I think that's pretty much it for the components of the system. So uh, really there was no way for us to to um, accurately address what their needs were and identify what their needs were without going ahead and modeling the whole system. Um, now, uh, since then, uh, you know, I guess the, the thing comes up, comes to, okay, we built the model, we've put all the, it, the data entry in there, um, next thing we do is we try to run flow through it, and we do that. Are we done? Not at all. Uh, this is where we run into the same criticism that engineers always run into, which is uh, it looks good on paper, but it doesn't work in real life. It doesn't work in practice. That's where calibration comes in. Uh, in a water system, relatively simple mechanism to do that. Uh, we'll typically put a device on the hydrants to measure your flow and pressure at various points throughout the system. Then we'll go back to the model and we'll look at see if it matches. If it doesn't match, um, there are numerous variables in the equations that are used in that model that can be adjusted. Uh, somebody said, why don't you just turn the knobs and switches until you get it to match, and I guess in a simplified world that's kind of what you do. But you're basically playing with some of those variables in those equations to get it to match. Um, also, you want to, it's extremely important to have good communication with the people that are operating that system, to identify ahead of time where some of the problem areas are that they're witnessing from operating the system. We have some uh, low pressure zones uh, in this system. We also had some quality issues where we didn't have uh, connectivity between lines or looping between lines that we knew of ahead of time. Um, but going back to turning those knobs and switches, uh, where that becomes really important is if you have to tweak them too much to match what you've seen here, that is a big red flag to tell you that there may be something going on in that system that nobody knows about and you wouldn't have known about uh, really before doing the modeling. For example, if the, if the pressures there are substantially less and flows substantially less than what we would see running that model simulation, and we go in and we start tweaking some of those factors and we just can't get it there. Um, that tells you that you may have a pipe restriction. You may have a valve you don't know exists that's shut off. Um, and and, and that's, that's where the tool becomes really helpful in going back and diagnosing some problems that you may not have even realized that you had. And taking it a step further, obviously, if you're going to add to the system, once you get it calibrated, it gives you that tool to do that predictive analysis that we were talking about. Um, in Campbellsburg's case, uh, they were actually having problems with the uh, water plant that's on the north end of their system up here. Um, they were able to show that we could do some minor upgrades at the south plant to meet their uh, capacity and usage need. Uh, we were able to run the model with some of the improvements into the system and show that they could run off of that plant solely. So they have shut down that north plant entirely. Uh, they're basically mothballing it. Uh, they're saving a lot of money on energy costs because they're not running two plants now. And uh, we're actually starting, uh, we just had the pre-con on the project to upgrade the south plant uh, Monday this week. So. so now moving into sewer systems. What's so difficult is the caption that I have. Uh, we've gone through the basics of building a model, but a sewer model it gets much more complicated than uh, a water model. And the big reason is rain. In a sewer system, let's just use a gravity system for example, um, dry weather flow, you're going to be running in a situation where you know, usually your pipes aren't completely full. It's basically an open channel flow type situation. You use certain calculations and equations for, to predict that, uh, that kind of flow. But when it rains, the system gets surcharged. It's operating under pressure. 
you've got a whole different series of calculations and equations that you're going to use in order to, to predict that flow. Uh, you also have what's depicted by this, and this is really, uh, this is taken from uh, the Herpic manual, which is a stormwater runoff manual, but it shows well what also happens in a sewer system when it rains. You're going to have multiple basins, if you will, that your sewers extend to. And when it rains here, it takes a long time for it to get down to this point. But if it's raining in these as well, you've got that additional input there, and your time of concentration is affected by that. Now, we also may have a situation where the rain blows through here or blows through here and, or here and not down here, and then that's going to cause a totally different situation within your, within your collection system. So how do we address that? We try to break it up into separate sewer sheds or sub-basins of your sewers. And each one of these needs to have a flow meter and you need to have some representation of the rainfall in that basin. If you don't have both, um, it's really not doing you any good because we've got to be able to show what rain event was triggering these flows that we see when we do the flow metering. So uh, this is just a typical uh, uh, you know, flow metering setup that I had in here. It shows the graphs that you're going to get from the flow meter data. Uh, you'll get, you'll get you know, basically it's measuring level and velocity and calculating the flow. So you do get some depth of, of water in there. And we need to look at both of those parameters uh, when we try to calibrate the model. So uh, we'll go through a couple brief examples here. Um, Dry weather flow, like we were talking, pretty predictable. So what you're looking at in the green is the actual flow meter data for this particular time frame. Uh, looking at about four days here. The reason we can tell that is because we've got the diurnal pattern you guys may know about. Uh, basically, this is nighttime. Uh, morning kicks in, and we see flow start to go up as people get up, take showers, cook breakfast, all that good stuff, then go to work during the day. And come home at night, again, our flows start to increase, and then go to bed and they taper off, and we have this low flow again at night. And you can see every day, one day, two days, three days, basically four days represented here. Green line is the pattern that we would expect. There was a spike there for some reason. We're not sure what that is. Um, the red line represents what we were able to get the model to do for this particular sewer shed. This is a good match. Um, you know, we're not going to be dead in the middle all the way through, but basically what we did is we built the model, then we went back and looked at dry weather periods, and we tweaked some of those variables that we could uh, to try to get these patterns to match. And you can see they match. This one's on flow. We would also do the same thing for level. But um, um, this one, you can see the timing's good, uh, the peaks are good, and, and the general pattern is there. This is what happens when it rains. Um, the blue up here that's coming down is the rain event. So we can see the rain started. It was pretty intense right there at first, and then it dropped off. We had a little bit of rain kick in thereafter. Again, the green line, we get rain. The flow meter data shoots up, drops back down, comes back up again a little bit, and then tapers off. So you can see how that matches with this rainfall. It comes up. This is where we had that second little bit of a rain event that kind of spiked it back up. And, uh, you know, this is really looking at your inflow when we talk about inflow and infiltration. Um, and then your infiltration component really is happening here until it gets back down to, if we extended this out, you'd see it drop back down, and then you'd start to see that diurnal pattern again that we saw in the previous slide. Um, yeah? Yes. It, it, it's, it's similar um, in effect, uh, you know, generally we get so much data you don't see too much of a difference, but uh, sometimes we have seen a little bit of difference on a weekend, but it's still kind of in a dry weather situation, still kind of holds, holds this same pattern. I can't tell, this is too small down there to see if we actually did capture, did capture that. I'll tell you another thing we see though, we do see spikes on uh, holidays. Um, and, and Brian Wilk can attest to that. We did some flow metering at uh, the discharge from the uh, truck stops that are at the intersection of 64 and 41 in Hobstock. And, man, we, I think we caught the 4th of July one year. 
and flows really shot up then, and you could see it. Uh, you, you could you could see it really well in that in that data. It's kind of cool to go back and, and compare and compare some of that stuff. Um, so what we're trying to find here uh, is problem areas. This is uh, this is actually some work that we did in Evansville. I've got a couple slides that we'll talk about uh, with that work. Try to keep on time here um, with that work that we did uh, that we did for the city of Evansville a few years back. Um, but but what we were looking for uh, was problem areas within the separate sanitary sewer system in Evansville. Uh, we built a model. Uh, we had flow data that we calibrated it to, and uh, we found we had I think five I think there were five separate sewer sheds that we had it split up into, and we actually had multiple flow meters within each sewer shed. Um, it, was, uh, it was a pretty, pretty extensive study. We had quite a bit of data to deal with. Uh, what we found was kind of in this area, the red dots are depicting areas where we were predicting overflow or heavily surcharged uh, manholes. And what we found was in this area, we were seeing an excessive loss of flow such that uh, the sewers are running down in this direction towards the bottom of the, of the page as you see it. We had a meter kind of in this area. I think that you can barely see if there's a green dot there and there's another one kind of buried in here. But uh, for each sewer shed, uh, we not only predict how much flow is coming in, but we would uh, add in the flow coming in from above it, obviously. Um, so once we got down to this meter, we had uh, flows coming from this meter plus whatever flows were added to the, from that particular sewer shed. And uh, the number here was smaller than the number here. So we knew we had a significant problem in this area. Went back and did some dis had some discussions with the city. They did, in fact, know of one, maybe two places where they were having sanitary sewer overflows. Um, one was right at a pizza hut, oddly enough. And uh, their parking lot would flood, and it wasn't flood water when it flooded. Um, but we did some investigative work in that area and determined a, a, number, uh, a number of more problems in the area. Um, I can tell you, if you've, if you've read the papers, you know Evansville sewers rates are going up. Uh, they've got a, they're in a battle with the EPA right now to try to determine what's appropriate for them to fix their problems. Uh, this is one of their early action projects is to address inflow and infiltration in this area, in this basin. Um, we actually had to actually go back. We were not able to get that model to calibrate because there was so much loss of flow. Um, and they've had to go back in and do additional studies and additional flow metering work. Uh, to try to uh, to try to get it to calibrate there. Um, another condition that we ran into that was uh, that was pretty difficult was uh, a boundary between a sanitary sewer system, where generally you're not letting rainwater in, and a combined sewer system. Again, using Evansville as an example, uh, this is basically the old part of town. Here's the bend in the Ohio River uh, of the city. And it's all combined sewer system. It was designed to handle both stormwater and, uh, and sanitary sewage whenever it rained. Um, the outlying areas that were developed later were designed only to handle sanitary sewage. In between those, about where this red line is, we have an interceptor called the Pigeon Creek Interceptor where the two converge and then flow down to wastewater treatment plant. Um, there were separate models that were developed for these areas. It wasn't one combined unified model. They had to do this one first and uh, this is probably a good time to talk about thinking ahead when you're doing your modeling and understanding if you've had a model done that it may not give you all the information that you may need at a later time. That model was done really for the intent of you know identifying overflows but as we did this as we were doing this work and trying to fine-tune where there were areas that they needed to do work within the collection system itself it really wasn't built for that purpose. So there was additional model building that had to be done uh, in that portion of the model. Now ours were all new. Um, so we have two models now that we're trying to combine along this boundary. And that's kind of what this, uh, this elevation 
shows. It's basically a, a, a pipe profile. So I'll kind of walk you through what we're looking at here. Um, this, this line represents the, the pipe itself, and we've got uh, manholes on each vertical line that you see going up. So we've got a bottom elevation for each manhole, and we've got a top elevation that's at the surface. And so you can see this is basically the topography along that run. We're crossing a creek here, so we have a siphon that's built in. It's higher on this side than on this side. Um, and then we go relatively flat, slope down to that red line Pigeon Creek interceptor. So I'll go back. So that's basically, uh, I think that's this system right here where it connects in right there. Um, so what we're seeing by the teal line, uh, the filler right there, is uh, we've had a rain event. And the rain event has, I'm not sure if this one happened downstream or upstream, but it has caused that interceptor to start to back up and start to submerge. So what we're trying to identify is are we having problems in the separate system because we've got too much rain coming in from here? Or are we having problems in it because of all the rain that's been captured here has got this thing so full that it has nowhere to go? Well, the next slide told us what was happening. Um, it's both, of course, but uh, at this point in time, it was first impacted by the inflow that we're getting from the combined system. That's hitting the system first. It's submerging uh, the discharge point so much that it's backing up into the separate system. What this dark blue line is, what is, is the hydraulic grade line, and it should generally slope in the direction of your flow. So what we're actually seeing is that flow is reversing and going backwards into that system. It has nowhere to go out. Um, so it's just causing backups. And, and until the levels go down in that interceptor, it's not going to relieve itself and let it actually drain. Um, this is also a good slide to show you how we find an overflow. Uh, the hydraulic grade line, if you will, basically represents the water level. So in this situation, we're fine. We're below the top of the manhole. Here we're not. This was one we would want to check. Here we're definitely not. So unless this lid is bolted down, well, it's going to be overflowing at that point. Um, one final example I'll go through. Um, this is Montpelier, and we had um, done some combined sewer modeling for them as part of their long-term control plan projects as well. Uh, we had one, two, three, four, five separate sewer sheds that we identified uh, or that we had split up as part of their system. Um, basically everything goes to the river, which is along here, uh, through an interceptor up to the wastewater treatment plant and there is a pumping station uh, right in here. I'm not sure, it may be that red, that red dot. Um, uh, we did some of the preliminary work on, uh, on the modeling in our Evansville office to help out the Fort Wayne office. They've taken it from there. Uh, but what we found uh, when we got to looking into the flow metering data and what the model was showing us was a couple interesting things. The red circles are depicting areas where we, uh, where we found some overflow uh, situations occurring. We knew about a couple of these going in from talking with the operator, but some of those sometimes uh, are in wooded areas and people don't know that they're ever overflowing. Um, and we were able to, I think it was these, we heard some reports that there may be some issues out there. The uh, model confirmed it. They went out and checked in some situations and did determine that, yeah, we've actually got a bottleneck going on in this situation that we need to address. Uh, the other kind of cool thing that was going on with the, uh, the CSOs, as I said, it should be flowing this direction. What we found was the, uh, the headworks and the uh, pumping station couldn't keep up. We had a surcharge condition in the line. This CSO couldn't relieve all of it. It's also impacted by the level of the water in the river. And uh, we actually saw reverse flow between these two and uh, more flow coming out of here. So uh, what that does then is lets us run some different scenarios and, and alternatives in the design to try to design the facilities that's, that's best, of, best fit for them, um, which, uh, you know, included some extra capacity here and, and uh, a couple other things out in, in the system. Basically, 
what I'm, I'm, I was hoping to do with my portion of this was just to show you guys what it takes to, to, uh, to put together a model, what some of the things are that it can tell you. Uh, it really, it's just another tool in your toolbox. Um, at the end of the day, what we hope it allows you to do is to prioritize these projects, to identify where your true needs are, and, uh, and spend money in the right places. With that, I will turn it over to Brian. If anybody has any questions, unless anybody has any questions for me now, if you do, I'll be here till the end. So, thank you. So, I'm going to build upon Eric's um, presentation, show you actually some of the software that we have. And I want to point out that all three of, our, three of our offices have this capability. The Fort Wayne office has a capability, Indianapolis office does, and so does Evansville. We get people all across the state being able to serve local communities. So I'm going to show you some of these software tools. And we're seeing that communities are wanting models for a variety of reasons. If you've got a long-term control plan, you're going to want it for that um, implementation for your combined system. So that's one area. So that's the most common area uh, if you get a combined system. We see, too, that um, people want models if they have a separate sanitary system with sanitary sewer discharges. It's a big problem. So we've been helping communities in that area. The third area is kind of more recent. We've seen some communities lately that are using this model as a growth tool. So they may not have separate sanitary uh, discharges. Um, in this case, they might have projected growth, in which case the model is being used to help them grow. The fourth case is uh, not, a, not necessarily sanitary or combined, but storm. There's been cases where we've used SWIM. Let me show you what happens when a sewer is not designed properly. I love this video. <laughs> okay, that's, that's compliments of YouTube. There's a lot going on there, but definitely the grade line's above the ground. Um, the second thing going on there is you've got some surge going on. Uh, typically, you see those with deeper facilities. In, in that case, that was actually a storm pipe. And um, swim and some of these tools can kind of show in red flag areas like that. There are other tools out there that will help you as well. So although swim is not really a surge model, it definitely can help out and say, hey, these areas you should pay attention to. Um, so kind of ties into swim. So I want to show you some of the swim live, which is risky for me to show you because <laughs> things crash. All right, so th this is actually swim uh, live. Basically, you've got a variety of swim softwares out there. Swim's a stormwater management model. This is XP swim. It's probably the most common software suites out there. It's gotten a lot better over the past 10 years. Basically, you can now integrate the entire GIS system into your SWIM model. So if you've got a SWIM model, you can pull those files in. Um, let me shut off the map and kind of show you. Like, so you can have your GIS layers. I'll back up. Your GIS layers are in black here, and so basically you can toggle them on and off, and you can get your, your manholes. Um, in this case here, what I'm showing you is an ongoing project in the city of Richmond. And so we are presently helping the city with one of their sub-basins. Sub uh, we sent out our surveying crew and, and laid it out. And let me show you a few features with this. Eric had mentioned that when you calibrate a model, you can turn the dials, if you will. Well, a lot of times these dials are related to what are called subcatchments. So what you have here are subcatchments that we 
that we identify, I think this thing went out. Is it working? Oh, yeah, it is. Okay, that you, that you identify. And he's right. You can turn the dial on these subcatchments, but sometimes you can turn the dial outside reality. So, you know, the whole phrase stupid in equals stupid out, you've got to be careful of that. So basically, we had to be very careful with, with the scenario here in Richmond. Let me, let me show you a couple of features of this. So when we calibrate a model, typically we adjust the subcatchments. The subcatchments drain to each of the, the manholes. And let me turn off the GIS layers. So when we were calibrating the city of Richmond, this here is um, near Earlham College, if anybody's familiar with it. Um, at this location, we had a meter. So right now, this is a location where we had a, a flow meter. Okay, so let me show you what you're looking at here. And I'll show this slide later, but what you have here is a graph of multiple colors. The horizontal axis is your time. The vertical axis is your flow. The, um, th the light blue is what the flow meter is doing, recording, or had recorded. The dark blue is the meter. And so what happened was initially, these two weren't matching at all. We had the whole rest of the model calibrated. And, and you look at this and you go, well, is, that, is this model pretty, pretty well calibrated? The answer is yes, it was very well calibrated. And I'll, I'll explain a couple of things about it, um, too. Um, first of all, there's a good agreement. You have one storm, two storm, three, four, five, six. And you look at that and you go, well, wait, not all of them hit. Well, it comes back to how much good data you're collecting. And if in a case where a storm hit a certain part of the city where your rain gauge was, um, you might not have had that storm hit the whole city at the same time. And you're kind of seeing that here. But for the most part, most of the storms were probably regional soakers. They soaked the whole city. So we had, th there's good calibration here. But this is not what it looked like initially. Initially, these two are way out of whack. And We've seen this in a few communities, and we pinned it down to an area downstream. So I just, this just gives you an idea. Basically, an area downstream I highlighted in purple um, is where we suspect a major, major clog. Okay, um, We've seen this signature I don't know how many times. The first time we've really seen it was in a, a community. It was one of our newer clients. Um, we went into the meeting with a lot of apprehension because it was one of these things where either we're going to look really smart or really stupid. And we basically told the city, hey, you got three locations where we suspect major clogs. Um, sure enough, every single one of those locations, they found root intrusion, um, collapsed pipe. And we suspect the same thing going on here. So th th this is some of the things you can get out of it. Now, the case for, with the city of Richmond is we're using this model to help them get additional capacity to help them not have um, as many SSDs. There's very few now, if any, but also to support future growth. So basically, the top graph, where the two graphs were out of phase, you can see the, the solid line. The solid line is the flow metering. The dotted line is what the model was predicting. Um, by clogging the downstream pipe, we got these two to match. Um, I saw this article a couple of months ago cracked me up. Uh, this basically is sewer was clogged with a teddy bear, a bike, a fax machine, some jeans, and a snake. So um, I don't know what's clogging the Richmond downstream pipe. Um, the city's investigating it. We, have, we actually have a meeting this week. They, they may actually provide some, some information on that. But um, we suspect that um, there'll be something major there. Um, in order to get the model to calibrate, we had to take the pipe, which was two feet in diameter, and reduce it 65%. So that gives you an idea of, of what kind of um, capacity we're talking about there. So sw SWIM is one category of software. There's many versions of it. There's XP SWIM, there's EPA SWIM, um, and there's Mike Urban. There's a whole bunch of them out there. They all do the same thing. Okay? They just have different interfaces. The next software I want to just talk to you about related to SURS is um, it's relatively new. It's, it's been on the market for a while, but commercially it's only been on the market for about a year. And um, that's Optimizer. So 
traditional swim approach, you take a look at a small sub-basin, you come up with a bunch of ideas. Um, are you going to do storage? Are you going to do conveyance? Are you going to pump it? Are you going to do some type of high-rate treatment? More often than not, if the sub-basin is small or if the city is small, you can do this using a manual approach. And basically, you'll use the model like the one we just saw and put in a new pipe or take an existing pipe and make it bigger or put in a pump station. Okay? So you can do a lot of these things manually. There comes a point where that becomes very inefficient and you get to the point where you can't wrap your head around it. And that's where this piece of software is big. So if you're a bigger community and you've got a lot of future projects, you may want to consider it. So this graphic here kind of just gives you an idea of the traditional approach. You might end up doing 25 trials. You'll lock in an alternative. You'll jump to a next alternative. You'll do a bunch of trials. With Optimizer, and I'll show you what it looks like in a second, it does it automatically. And, and it's absolutely amazing. There are advantages and disadvantages of this, and I'll, I'll give you some um, recaps as we look through it. But we're talking about taking trials and going into thousands, 10,000, all these iterations, trying to figure out what the best um, you know, solution is. So let me just show you the software and it'll give you an idea. So this is kind of a recap screen. Let me just show you what we're looking at here. So this is another existing project that we're helping the city of Fort Wayne with. A lot of people know city of Fort Wayne has a combined, has a combined sewer community. It has a separate sanitary area just like Evansville. But over the next 20 to 30 years, they're going to be doing massive infrastructure. Um, in this case, I don't know, what do you think, Andrew? Like 100, over 100 options were thrown at us? So we're not talking about the smaller model we just saw with Richmond. We're talking about, in this case, 159 pages of options. And every single one of these pages is a pipe, a pump, a storage facility. There might be a section of town where the city is determining, hey, we might want storage here. Well, what if we don't do storage? What if we do a pump station? Well, what if we do an interceptor? What if we do high rate treatment? So the sky's the limit with the software. It can take a big system and, and you can throw whatever you want at it. In this case, the city of Fort Wayne helped us and we helped them develop pretty much the next 20 years of their planned projects. And we're in the process of this project right now, still ongoing. So th this is their model. I'll give you an idea of, of the differences between this and SWIM. All right, so you look at it initially, and if you zoom in on this, you say, okay, it doesn't look too much different than SWIM. You get your pipes, you get your nodes, you get your links, you get your, all the same things we've looked at before. But um, the difference is you get the pulling cost tables. So the steps in this are threefold. The first thing you got to do is work with the community to come up with all the what ifs. What are all the things we think might work? You come up with a document such as this. In this case, we actually built upon their GIS. So that's the first part. The second part is we got to get this into the model. We've got 150 pages over way over 100 alternatives. Let's get it into the model. With Optimizer, you still use the same tools you had before. This, this here is a snapshot of EPA SWIM. And when you look at this, you see a whole bunch of nodes and links. And I'm really zoomed out here. But if you zoom in, you can see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of nodes. But the point is, all those 150 or pages that I mentioned earlier, all those options were put in the model. And then the next step is once you're done this, that's when the new software comes in. The new software takes all of those alternatives and throws a cost to it. So when you go through it, you see a lot of the same features. You get these pull down menus, but there's a whole nother corridor here of data. So basically, what's the cost of installing open cut? What's the cost of installing trenchless pipe? What's the cost of a pump station? And so you have to develop all these tables. A lot of these tables have been developed by Optimizer. A lot of these communities already have these tables as, long, as their long-term control plan. You just put it in there. 
Now, this is not as easy as it sounds. This takes time, okay? Once you get all these in there, you get the cost tables. Um, this is where things get kind of um, a little bit different than before. Um, before, we could do a lot of these alternatives in-house. We've got computational computers that are just fantastic. There comes a point where if you're going to be running thousands and thousands of runs, you can't do it in-house anymore. So in the case of a large city and a project like this, you would have to actually rent computational time on something like Amazon.com. So in this case, city of Fort Wayne has a one-year, I don't know how many CPUs rented, okay? And basically at this point, once you get everything in there, you send this to the cloud service, and the cloud service runs SWIM thousands of times. And each time it gets a solution, it points in the direction of cost efficiency. And thousands and thousands and thousands of times it does that. It's absolutely amazing. Um, it's proprietary. Um, Optimatics is the proprietary owner of the software. They have what's called a genetic algorithm. I don't even know what that is. All I know is that it, it, it takes the solutions and it points it in the right direction. So what, am I, what are you looking at here? Well, you're looking at cost. And when you do cost, you just can't look at construction costs. You've got to look at O&M. You've got to look at you know, um, the, um, you know, what percentage of the cost per year is going to be on O&M. What's the construction cost? So the, the, the vertical axis is cost, and the horizontal axis is the number of runs. And you see the cost come down. And that's pretty much what the software does. This, this is a, this, this, what you're looking at here is like, what, three weeks ago, Andrew? Okay. Right now, the city of Fort Wayne, I think, is up to like 500 to 1,000 runs because it keeps running and running and running. And basically, it's coming down, down, down. And so, in the end, what does it do? Um, it pretty much takes something that you just can't put your head around and gives you possibilities. This is going to zero down on two optimal solutions. We're presenting those to the city on this coming Monday. And basically, are those going to be the end? No. The optimal solutions are going to say, here's what we think is going on that you can really optimize your system um, and meet a level of control. Everybody talks about level of control with combined sewer overflows, 10-year, one-hour storm, or a one-year, one-hour storm. You can put whatever level of control on this you want. In the case of Fort Wayne, they're trying to meet their long-term control plan. But basically, so they're going to come up with some solutions. The next round would be the final optimization runs. So when we go through these two solutions, they're going to go from two to one. And then they're going to really hone in on, hey, what's really going to be the most cost effective for the city? And you look at this and you go, oh my god, I got to rent Amazon.com. I got all this work for the, the, the main document at the beginning, um, plus all the meetings, whatever. But when you take a look at potential cost savings, this is a drop in the bucket if you can get rid of a construction project. Okay, So it's just food for thought. This is brand new in the market. Until about a year ago, you couldn't purchase the software. If you wanted to do this, you had to hire Optimatics. In this case, um, we're one of the few, if only, um, companies here in Indiana that are even doing this. Um, so that's Optimizer. It, it's, it's swim on steroids, pretty much. I just want to hit upon a couple of other things. Al had mentioned treatment plant models. And Eric had talked about boundary conditions. Um, there are many other software suites this company uses. I'm like a kid in a candy shop. We've got Swim. We've got XP Swim. We've got Mike Urban. I'll talk about these couple of other ones. Eric had mentioned water, ch water modeling. We have WaterCAD. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have a lot of time to talk about WaterCAD. But two other softwares that are relatively new um, deal with treatment plants. Because when you're modeling, you want to know what's going, going on downstream. So there's one that's called Visual Hydraulics. Some of you might have seen this at past workshops. I'm just going to touch upon it very lightly. Swim is not a good tool for treatment plants. Okay, So you've got to kind of back out of it once you get to that point where you hit the headworks. And in which case, there are other tools out there that are much better suited to do that. And this, this is one. It's called Visual Hydraulics. And, and we use this as a design tool. You know, we, we had a lot of projects today talking about upgrades at plants. Well, behind the scene, a lot of that is checking, making sure the hydraulics works. So th these are all the tools you could use. 
There are some communities that want us to build these for them. They like to use them as operational, um, um, like City of Fort Wayne does this, um, so that they use it throughout the year, actually. Um, so it, it's, it's no different than before. You get nodes and links. And each one of these is a location. So you might have a pipe and a weir. And as you work your way from, in this case, the, the river, all the way back through the plant, you can see the elevation change. The nice thing is you can, you can change the flows. And so you can look at things from a hydraulic standpoint. Um, the last thing that we recently acquired, this is relatively new software as well, is um, process modeling. So the previous slide was hydraulic modeling. I wish there was one that had both, but there is nothing out there right now that has both. So if you're trying to look at hydraulics, in other words, flow, velocities, elevations, the previous software in your plant's great. But if you're trying to look at efficiencies, treatment removals, this is the piece to use. Okay? They're definitely, they definitely complement each other, there's no doubt. But um, there are defi definitely differences. So in the case of what Al had mentioned earlier about coming up with predictive tools to assess whether your treatment can be changed to meet phosphorus limits or, or um, your ammonia limitations, um, th th this is the tool to do that. And we've got, we've, um, we've got this as well in-house. Um, in this case, you can kind of see dissolved oxygen, ammonia, nitrate, mixed liquor, suspended solids being tracked. And it's, it, a lot of these models have same features. They have nodes and links. The difference here is that each one of these nodes is, is a treatment equation based on theory or based on lab data. So you can predict how much BOD am I breaking down, how much, how much, um, how much nitrate is being degraded, things of that nature. Eric and I would be happy to answer any of your questions and, um, either here or later. Any questions? Am I asking too many questions? <laughs> You're doing a nice job, Mike. So I'm trying to get a grasp. One of your earlier slides was an aerial of yeah. some lines yeah. going down. Uh, and you mentioned GIS layers. Yep. So I assume that you'd want to layer in blood plains, wetlands, Right, am I right about yeah. that? Okay. Do all that. Maybe demographics. Mm -hmm. So how do you layer do that do the GIS layer, say for that map there? It's no different than your existing if, if you've got GIS RA, you most likely mm -hmm. have like an arc suite. You have different layers, shape files, you name it. You basically pull them in as layers, no different than the other software you have. So you really don't have to make up anything new. You can pull these layers in. We've only got two layers here of the sewer system. And I'll shut the map off. And that, that was the driver of what we were doing. In fact, we found locations that there are differences. You can kind of see where the differences are. Our data is, is accurate. We just sent our surveyors out. So the one thing that's nice is that we can use this to help communities update certain sections of the GIS as they build their model. Um, you can put in flood maps. It's really helpful too when you look at data and you're trying to figure out, hey, why are we having so much flood here? Or, or maybe this uh, another source of water. And if you've got that visual, it might help you as well. Well, you mentioned that they want to use this for planning too. Yeah, Plus, absolutely. So do they access the government GIS data for the, or uh, FEMA's firm maps for that? or? You um, could. You'd have to convert them in a, a, a <coughs> format that's readable. I don't know if all of those are readable. Um, and if not, it's easy to convert in house. There are certain tools that you can use um, to do that. So, um, but definitely nowadays, the higher end swim models, or even the optimizer that I showed you, those have GIS capabilities. And um, the, the bare bones free version. This is swim five, it does not have that. So th this is probably like the simplest swim out there all the way up to the most advanced. And as you get up to the advanced, you're getting way more features and you know, helpful visuals. Any other questions? Well, thank you.
And um, if you have any questions afterwards, I'll be at dinner and every one of us as well. So thank you.